All right. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Weiss, for having been here. And Sven, thanks for stepping in at the last minute. Um, really appreciate having you here as well. Hi, Mike. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I'm sorry. I was looking forward actually to the to the talk with Dr. Weiss's. Um, and I'm sorry that we're switching gears now, but I'm happy to uh, use the time to talk a little bit about MRI um, ultrasound fusion biopsy uh, for the t detection of prostate cancer. And actually, uh, when the Empire series started up and uh, was really an amazing effort by uh, the residents, previous residents of ours and Dr. Badalado, um, I was actually not able to sign up for any of these spots because I was out with COVID, but I'm very happy to have the opportunity now to uh, jump in. And uh, we can just use the time to talk a little bit about um, fusion biopsy, I thought. Uh, so in general, what I would like to talk about um, is to just give an overview a little bit of why are we using actually, uh, uh, and what kind of MRIs are we using? What type should we use? Should we use endorectal coils? Uh, why are certain <clears> of <throat> the newer MRI modalities better than older MRI mod modalities? And then I really want to talk about uh, the type of um, MRI guided biopsies that we can do, that we can offer to patients, um, <clears throat> the different fusion biopsy systems, and uh, what the advantages really are of MRI ultrasound fusion prostate biopsies, how we select the patients, and uh, talk a little bit about the learning curve of uh, biopsy at the end, and then also uh, finish with the AUA consensus statement. Um, so, as, as you know, the um, original biopsy scheme for the detection of prostate cancer consisted of a sextant biopsy, so really six uh, uh, biopsies that were taken, uh, three from the left, three from the right, based on the STAMI uh, publication from 1989. And slowly over the years, this transitioned into a 12-core biopsy um, as a standard of practice. Actually, Mike, are you recording this also? Do I need to do anything with this, or what are we We're recording it, Sven. Okay, just wanna make sure. Um, and then, so this transitioned into a 12 core biopsy, which uh, ultimately led to an increased negative predictive value. But of course, it also led to an increased detection really of low volume and low risk disease, which is not really the cancer that we would like to find um, instead of the clinically significant type that we're interested in. Um, in general, the standard transrectal approach has a really uh, a poor ability to really have uh, sample anterior or, or apical and midline cancers. And in many cases also leads to an underdiagnosis really of this clinically significant disease that we're interested in. So uh, about 30% of um, these low volume, low risk diseases are upgraded then or upstaged at home uh, sections that were done on prostates, meaning that the, the uh, standard 12 core biopsy is really not uh, perfect um, to assess the prostate really entirely. And interestingly, <clears throat> the prostate is also really uh, pretty much the only organ actually in our body where we have the standardized sampling approach where we don't, where we do not really, or where we haven't been targeting really lesions until the MRIs have uh, improved really in their um, ability to, to, to detect lesions in the prostate. Uh, but in most uh, other organs in our body, uh, we have actually um, imaging technologies or direct visualization that helps us detect lesions. But in the prostate, we, we, have, we were still doing actually these random samplings. And then MRI has been around actually also for a long time actually in the, in the um, use of staging prostate cancer in patients that had a biopsy proven diagnosis of prostate cancer already in the 1980s. And initially these MRIs were really only consistent of uh, morphologic images of the prostate and T1 and T2 weighted images, which over the years has, has changed. Uh, this is one of the first publications um, that talked about MRI and the use really to look at prostate cancer. They used a 0.35 Tesla magnet. And as you know, nowadays we use a three Tesla magnet, so it's uh, much different. And uh, they did find that malignant prostate tissue really had a different um, uh, appearance on MRI, a different signal um, than the surrounding benign tissue. And they were able to really distinguish that already early on. And since then, clearly the magnets, as I mentioned, have become um, stronger and the resolution has improved significantly. Um, the advances in this um, MRI technology and the hard end software really uh, led to the, to the um, development of this multi-parametric MRI technology, which consists still of anatomic images, the T2-weighted images, but also of uh, functional and physiologic images, such as diffusion-weighted imaging, apparent diffusion coefficient maps, and dynamic uh, contrast-enhanced um, MRIs, the, the, uh, sample, the examples you see on the bottom. 
Um, so what kind of MRI do we really need? So we still discuss often whether we use uh, or we should use three Tesla MRIs or 1.5 Tesla MRIs. Do we need to use an endorectal coil or no coil? Um, do we really need a multi-parametric MRI? And what are really the improvements and advantages uh, one over the other? Um, and this was a study uh, that looked at a cohort of patients where half of them underwent a 1.5 Tesla MRI with an endorectal coil to assess the prostate. And the other half of the patients um, underwent a three Tesla MRI without an endorectal coil. Um, and basically what they found was that the prostate dimensions and the image quality was really um, uh, uh, comparable actually between the two. They were rated by one board certified radiologist and one medical physicist. And um, the likelihood of uh, peripheral zone cancers in each of these sextants and the local extents was rated and compared. But basically, there was no significant difference in the correlation of these MRI images and in the pathology. So a non-endorectal coil 3 Tesla MRI basically was found to provide the same quality of images that was uh, obtained with the 1.5 Tesla MRI in combination with an endorectal coil. So the, the endorectal coil really on an appropriate MRI nowadays is not really um, uh, needed anymore. Um, so this is a study um, from uh, 2011 from the Journal of Urology that looked at the correlation of MRI images, multi-parametric MRI images with prostate pathology. And here basically 45 patients had biopsy proven prostate cancer. They all underwent a multi-parametric MRI and then prostatectomy. And the specimens were then whole mount sectioned and compared to um, the uh, appearance of the tumors on the MRI. And then so total of 45 prostatectomy specimens, there were 342 um, positive regions for lesions. Um, the, out of these, 232 were greater than five millimeters, so had a more significant size. And the positive predictive value basically for all four sequences really on the multiparametric MRI was 98% uh, for the peripheral zone tumors. And this was compared to only 69% for only T2 weighted images alone. So this was significantly better. Um, and clearly the sensitivity increased with the lesion size and also with the aggressiveness, the Gleason score of the lesions. So three Tesla MRI really was shown here to, to allow for the detection of prostate cancer and multiparametric MRI was found to have a superior predictive accuracy really for the diagnosis. So when we think about MRI, you know, using MRI now for a guided biopsy, so the question is what are really the different types of um, biopsies that we can do under the guidance of MRI? And there are, in general, three different types. So one is basically using the MRI, having the patient in the MRI scanner and targeting a lesion while the patient is in, um, in, in the gantry basically itself. That is one option. And the second option would be to use the MRI, uh, study the images and apply the knowledge of the, these images then onto the ultrasound image and try to uh, guide the needle based on the knowledge into um, similar areas on the ultrasound uh, image of the prostate. And then the third way would be to really use a software that fuses both MRI and ultrasound images and uh, target the lesions that way. So talking about the first one, so the patient here is shown in the MRI scanner itself, um, uh, but in prone position. So it's pretty uncomfortable actually for the patient. It's very time consuming, labor intensive, and uh, also from an economic standpoint, not really uh, sustainable if the patient is lying in an MRI scanner for two or three hours to have a prostate biopsy done. Um, you know, there they can be many other patients that can have um, diagnostic MRIs and from, from that perspective, not really um, economically uh, sound. And the other uh, difficulty with this is also that usually with this type of biopsy, there are no systematic biopsies that can be obtained. It can really only be um, a lesion targeted based on the eye MRI image while the patient is here in the gantry. So we don't really do these type of um, biopsies. And I have to say my practice over the last several years, I've never had a patient actually who underwent this type of biopsy. Uh, cognitive fusion biopsy now, as I mentioned, is more is, is a uh, technology where we look at the MRI and if we do not have the software to fuse the MRI image now with the ultrasound image, we can try to understand the images and apply the knowledge, as I mentioned, onto the ultrasound image. So here basically, uh, there's no additional hardware software really needed for this. It is clearly dependent on who does the biopsy, who looks at the MRI, how comfortable is that person to really interpreting the images and applying this onto the ultrasound uh, image. 
um, there's no feedback really on the images to tell you that you're in the right spot. It's basically just understanding the location of a lesion on the MRI and then trying to understand that location on the ultrasound. Um, the reliability has been, um, is quite limited, of course, um, by detecting prostate cancer, especially if the lesions are small or if those are areas in the prostate that are not easy to access. But overall, this has, has actually led to good results. Um, this is a study that looked at that. There were uh, 82 patients that had an initial negative prostate biopsy underwent then um, a multiparametric MRI and had a um, suspicious lesion, underwent then a systematic biopsy and a cognitive fusion biopsy. And in more than 50% uh, of these patients, they were found to have uh, prostate cancer. Um, all biopsy cores were then divided into the um, uh, targeted biopsies and the systematic cores. And 30% of the cognitive targeted cores uh, showed actually uh, prostate cancer versus uh, only 3% of the systematic cores found prostate cancer. So uh, cognitive fusion biopsy, if applied by somebody who is able to read actually uh, images of the MRI and uh, can apply this onto ultrasound images and understands the three dimensions, uh, uh, the three dimensional image of the prostate on the ultrasound actually has a, has a certainly an improvement over a systematic course alone, but um, if the technology is available, then we really use this MRI-guided software fusion biopsy technology. And basically what is being done here is um, that the um, MRI is being read by the radiologist. The radiologist uh, creates basically a three-dimensional image of the prostate on the MRI. This image then is uploaded onto uh, the ultrasound machine that we use in the, in the clinic to do the biopsy, the transrectal biopsy. And then these, uh, the, right, the urologist who does the biopsy in the office creates a three-dimensional image of the prostate based on ultrasound images. And these two images then are basically merged. And we have three, uh, two three-dimensional images that are overlying each other now. And within the MRI three-dimensional image, we have one, two, three, four targets. And they appear then also, also of course, after the fusion, on the um, ultrasound image of the prostate and can be targeted based on ultrasound then um, using the MRI images. I'll show you in a minute how this looks basically in practice, but this uh, is relatively easy to do. Um, just requires a few more minutes of time in the clinic basically with the patient uh, under local anesthesia and can be very easily incorporated into an existing workflow. So the, the systems that exist, there are a multitude of systems nowadays. So the most common ones are listed here. Uh, I just want to talk about the first one. Uh, this is basically the one that we use in our clinic and probably the most common one together with the Artemis system, uh, Uranav by Invivo or Philips. This is an image here on the left side from my clinic, basically, where on the left side we have the uh, fusion device, uh, which is basically just a, a computer. Um, a hard drive and it is connected to the ethernet of the hospital so that uh, the MRI images can be uploaded onto that computer. And this is connected to the standard ultrasound device here on the right. And then um, clearly there's the uh, transrectal ultrasound probe that uh, is compatible with the fusion device. We have a tracking device that is being held over the, uh, or that's being positioned over the patient. This basically tracks the movement and the position of the handheld um, transrectal ultrasound probe here. And this tells them basically the examiner how to target the lesion or how to, how to address uh, the lesion that is seen on the MRI. Um, the prostate is scanned then basically um, on the ultrasound uh, and two dimensional images are taken. And out of this, then I create a three dimensional image of the prostate. And you can see, I have, I have another image actually on another slide uh, where this red thing here is a three dimensional image of the prostate from the MRI. And this is then fused with my uh, 3D image of the prostate on the ultrasound. And this is then how we get the target basically uh, shown on the ultrasound. You can see here, this is the ultrasound image basically. This is the MRI image. On the MRI image, clearly visible a lesion here in the anterior part of the prostate. On the ultrasound image, the lesion is not really clearly visible, but now with the outline that was basically taken from the MRI because the two um, image modalities were now fused, you can clearly see the lesion and you can target the lesion with a biopsy, although on the ultrasound image alone, the lesion would not be distinguishable really from the uh, surrounding tissue. And this is what it looks like in the clinic, basically. Here you see again the 
uh, fused image now, the three-dimensional image of the prostate, MRI, ultrasound, fusion image of the prostate together with the lesion. And here in uh, sagittal uh, view, we can see a bullseye here that can be targeted and the transrectal biopsy of the targeted lesion can be done uh, relatively straightforward. So what are really now the advantages of um, this type of fusion biopsy? So this was a study that came out, out of the group from uh, NYU that did a lot of research and initially started a fusion program early on. Uh, these were 600 patients, basically. They all underwent a multiparametric MRI and then um, a fusion biopsy with the Artemis system. The Artemis system was the other system that I mentioned uh, shortly in the overview, which is a little bit different from the uh, uranf, but the principle is pretty much the same. Um, almost half of these patients had not had a prior biopsy, so they were uh, biopsy naive. 30% uh, had a prior negative prostate biopsy, and there were 23% of these patients that had a prior uh, positive biopsy. So basically, these were patients that were on active surveillance for prostate cancer, but there was no one in this group that had had a prior targeted biopsy. So nobody had a fusion biopsy done before. Um, and as I said, everybody had undergone a multiparametric MRI before. Uh, the MRI was graded by the five-point Likert scale at that time, which is very similar to what we use nowadays, the PIRAT score. And um, they found basically that the overall detection of all prostate cancer was pretty similar between the fusion biopsy and the sy systematic biopsy. So all patients underwent fusion biopsy of the target plus the systematic biopsy of the rest of the prostate, and the overall detection of all prostate cancer was relatively similar. But the fusion biopsy, the targeted part, uh, detected fewer Gleason 6 and more Gleason 7 prostate cancers, which was a significant difference, and it also detected more Gleason 4 dominant prostate cancer, so uh, more clinically significant prostate cancers in general. Um, the men were then stratified into two groups. Uh, one group were the ones with a low or equivocal suspicion score on the MRI, which was basically a Likert scale, uh, on, on the Likert scale it was a number two or three. And the other group were patients with a high or a very high MRI sus suspicion score, four and five. Um, and basically 370 men were there with a score of two and three. And in these, the fusion biopsy detected fewer prostate cancers overall, but was similar for the detection of Gleason 7 or greater. In, in those men, though, with a, a score of 4 and 5 on the Likert scale, so a suspicious or very suspicious um, lesion on the MRI for harboring clinically significant prostate cancer, the fusion biopsy detected more prostate cancers overall and also more higher grade cancers, which was significant, um, clinically significant, the difference. So in, in men with a score uh, of four or five, when stratified by the biopsy indication, though, the fuse, fusion biopsy also detected more Gleason 7 or greater in all three groups, but fewer Gleason 6 in the biopsy-naive patients. And you can see this on the following slides, which is an overview of, of these three groups again. So here basically um, are uh, fusion biopsies, again, uh, in those patients that either had no prior biopsy before, a prior negative biopsy, or prior a positive uh, biopsy, and those were people on active surveillance. Those are the three groups depicted here. In the first group, the, the fusion biopsy detected less, signif less clinically significant, um, I'm sorry, detected uh, significantly less cancers overall due to signif significantly lower detection of Gleason 6 cancers. You can see this here. Gleason 6 are basically the light orange ones. Gleason 7 are the darker orange ones. So overall, less Gleason 6 cancers. Um, but slightly more uh, clinically significant cancers, 30 versus 25 percent, but overall less uh, cancers detected overall due to the significantly less detection of Gleason 6 cancers. In the second group, those with the prior negative biopsy, um, the uh, detection of Gleason 7 was higher here you now, 16 versus 9 percent, uh, and the detection of Gleason 6 uh, was pretty much similar. And in those with um, a prior diagnosis of prostate cancer of so patients on active surveillance. Um, again, the fusion biopsy detected slightly less cancers overall due to significantly lower detection of Gleason 6 cancers, but a uh, higher detection of Gleason 7 cancers, which are the ones that we're interested in. So in, uh, basically, the fusion biopsy detected more Gleason 7 or greater cancers while limiting the detection of indolent disease, regardless of uh, the prostate biopsy history, whether the patient is prostate biopsy naive 
had a, a negative prostate biopsy or a diagnosis even of prostate cancer, uh, the higher the MRI shows suspicion score, the higher, of course, the likelihood to find Gleason 7 or greater, which uh, makes sense. And um, clearly, the study showed that there is a, a clinical impact and benefit of the fusion biopsy which varies a little bit by biopsy indication, but it seems to offer a clear benefit in all three groups in this study. And it really suggests that uh, a pre-biopsy MRI and fusion biopsy should be considered in all men that undergo a prostate biopsy. Now, there are a few trials that I want to talk about that were um, very well, well done and were published in the last few years. Uh, three trials, basically, um, that I will um, present. So one of these uh, is the so-called precision trial that was um, published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2018. Those were uh, 500 biopsy-naive patients now that were randomly assigned to either a systematic uh, trust biopsy, and they, these patients did not have an MRI before, or the patients had a multiparametric MRI and then a fusion biopsy followed, or if the patients had an, an MRI that was negative, no biopsy was done in patients. So these were these three groups. And the detection of Gleason uh, 3 plus 4 or greater was basically significantly higher in those men that were assigned to the MRI and fusion biopsy um, in comparison to those that were assigned to systematic biopsy only. Uh, basically, the detection rate was 38% where this 20, 26%, which was uh, statistically different um, in this comparison. Um, this is basically shows the detection of Gleason 3 plus 4 again, uh, that was significantly higher in the multiparametric MRI uh, fusion biopsy group than in, this, in the systematic biopsy group, which I just mentioned. Um, so uh, uh, favoring again the performance of a fusion biopsy in this cohort. Uh, another trial was published also a couple of years ago in The Lancet. It's called the MRI FIRST trial, uh, which was a multi-center perspective study uh, from France. Here were 251 patients that were scheduled for a uh, first biopsy. They were all biopsy naive. Basically, their PSA had to be less than 20. They all underwent a multiparametric MRI of the prostate. Uh, the uh, urologist uh, that performed the 12-core systematic biopsy, was blinded to the uh, MRI results, did the 12-core biopsy, and then a second urologist went in and did a fusion biopsy in these patients of their uh, MRI lesion. Also, the MRI lesions here were um, graded by the Likert scale, and uh, only lesions of uh, Likert 3 or 4 or 5 were biopsied. And here, basically, um, uh, the results showed that uh, overall there were 21 percent of the patients that had, had a negative MRI, uh, 94 patients or 37 percent of the patients with a positive MRI uh, were found to have clinically significant prostate cancer. And here, interestingly, uh, 13 of those were basically diagnosed on systematic biopsy only. 19 of these were diagnosed by fusion biopsy only. But when patients underwent both, so the combination, I mean, all of them underwent both, but when you take these together, the combination of fusion biopsy plus um, uh, systematic biopsy, uh, when both were performed, then 66% um, were found to have clinically significant prostate cancer. So basically, clinically significant prostate cancer would have been missed in 5% if systematic biopsy had not been done and 8% if fusion biopsy had not been done. So basically, there was no difference between systematic biopsy and fusion biopsy in the detection of Gleason uh, 3 plus 4 or greater, but it was this detection rate was basically improved by combining both techniques, and they uh, basically showed a substantial added value to each other when they were combined. And then obtaining the MRI before the biopsy in biopsy that eat men means it improves really the detection of clinically significant prostate cancer. And there's also still a need for the added systematic biopsy. But basically, this trial shows that even in biopsy naive men, uh, an MRI should be done at the beginning of their um, pathway to diagnosis because it helps really in the detection of uh, prostate cancer. The discussion is still going on. And the AUA statements have not been updated so far uh, with regards to uh, using MRI in biopsy naive men. But these are a couple of trials that show actually the benefit that might exist here. And then another uh, important trial is the PROMISE trial, uh, published a year earlier, also in the Lancet, which was a multi-center um, paired cohort study, which basically tested the, the accuracy, again, of multiparametric MRI 
uh, compare to trust biopsy against a template prostate mapping biopsy as a reference. And uh, as I said, the objective was here the, to test the accuracy of MRI only compared to trust biopsy in detecting prostate cancer. Um, clinically significant prostate cancer here in this trial, which is important, was defined as Gleason 4 plus 3 or greater in comparison to 3 plus 4 or greater in the previous trial, uh, or if the maximum cancer core exceeded 6 millimeters. These were all biopsy-naive men also with a PSA of less than 15. And uh, basically it showed there were 576 men that underwent a 1.5 Tesla multiparametric MRI without an endorectal coil. And uh, this is one of the criticisms of this trial that um, the uh, you know, MRI scanner had only 1.5 Tesla magnet, no endorectal coil was used. And as we discussed earlier, in, in these weaker magnet MRIs, really an endorectal coil might be still needed. But however, we nowadays don't even use the 1.5 Tesla MRIs anymore. But all these patients then underwent a truss biopsy and the template mapping biopsy. Uh, the results showed that the multiparametric MRI was more sensitive than a truss biopsy with 93 to 48% in the detection of uh, clinically uh, significant prostate cancer, but the MRI was much less specific than the regular trust biopsy with 41 versus 96%. Um, the negative predictive value of multiparametric MRI uh, for the detection of clinically significant prostate cancer was 89%. And uh, to detect uh, Gleason 3 plus 4, when we switch from 4 plus 3 to 3 plus 4, the negative predictive value was only 76%. So basically, um, using multiparametric MRI alone, a total of 27% of men could have avoided a primary biopsy uh, if the subsequent truss biopsy had been erected by the MRI. So basically, if a fusion biopsy had been done and not just a truss biopsy based on the MRI results, up to 18% more cases of clinically significant prostate cancer would have been detected. Um, so MRI really is able to reduce the overdiagnosis of clinically insignificant prostate cancer and improve the detection of clinically significant prostate cancer. And targeted biopsy alone would have missed a substantial number of Gleason 3 plus 4 cancers really um, uh, it, uh, uh, in general in this study. So, Coming back to our original, uh, the original overview I showed and the talking points that I wanted to hit, um, basically what, are, what kind of MRI are we using? I mentioned it multiple times, the three Tesla multiparametric MRI is really the standard of care now. The end-directed coil is not really uh, needed for this um, stronger man magnet because the resolution and the image quality is just so much more superior to the uh, 1.5 Tesla MRI. Uh, the only caveat exists in patients with um, Joint implants, for example, a hip implant can give a, a multitude of artifacts if we use a very strong um, uh, magnet. Uh, so in these cases, actually, we go back sometimes to the 1.5 Tesla uh, <coughs> uh, MRI in combination with an endorectal coil, just because the uh, significance of artifacts is a little bit less. We can see the prostate better on those uh, in these type of patients. Um, we try to limit the number of radiologists really involved in reading the MRIs. It's a big uh, uh, variability in, in, in how MRIs are being read, who prepares the MRI uh, and gets the three-dimensional image ready, the segmentation ready for the fusion biopsy. So the fewer radiologists involved or the better they are trained, of course, the higher the quality of the images that we use for the uh, biopsy. Uh, the type of MRI-guided biopsy I touched upon, uh, I rarely really would uh, refer a patient to interventional radiology for an in-gantry uh, biopsy. We use a software technology, the in vivo device in our clinic. Um, if this is not available in some satellite offices, the uh, fusion device might not be available. We can also use a cognitive uh, uh, fusion technique, as I said. Basically, the knowledge of the MRI lesion uh, can help us find the lesion on the ultrasound, even if it's not visible on the ultrasound image uh, itself. Uh, the biopsy system we use is the uh, Uranav system by Philips. Uh, the advantage really is um, to detect more clinically significant prostate cancers and limit the detection of clinically insignificant prostate cancer. Um, the questions that exist, do we really have to do a targeted plus the systematic biopsy? But as I showed in the um, MRI first trials and, and the 
precision trial, we really need to combine these because they have an added value. And for now, I think we still need to be a, need to um, do a systematic biopsy in combination with a targeted biopsy because the detection rate of clinically significant cancer otherwise would be significantly less and we would miss significant uh, disease if we didn't uh, combine these biopsy techniques. However, if MRI images in the future uh, improve, then we might be able to maybe uh, not uh, add the systematic biopsy to the targeted biopsy. Now, who are the patients that we do these uh, you know, fusion biopsies on? I really try to do it on all my patients. Um, uh, in the beginning, we only uh, started by, uh, or mainly uh, did it in patients who had a negative previous biopsy based on the uh, limited data that existed at that point. But as I showed you in the studies that came out in 2017, 18, and also more recently, uh, biopsy naive patients really benefit from a multi-parametric MRI uh, before their first biopsy as well. What I didn't really talk about was the number of cores uh, that I usually take. So we do the systematic biopsy, which is 12 cores. And before we do the systematic biopsy, I take about two cores per target. So if I have one target, I add uh, two cores. If I have two targets, um, it's, will be add, it will add a a uh, total of four cores to the 12 cores. So the number of biopsy cores goes up with the number of targets that we have to target. And clearly the discomfort level of the patient will also increase slightly um, based on um, the location and the number of lesions. So I, you know, one case that will always actually uh, stay in my memory is a uh, patient that came to my office on a Friday afternoon, came to my clinic, 58 years old, had a PSA of 92. It was actually repeated. He had a couple of numbers. One was 89, the other was 92. And clearly he, need, he needed a prostate biopsy, a normal prostate exam, surprisingly, and no other symptoms, healthy guy. So I told him I can do the biopsy on Monday. We have to find out what's going on. I actually did not do an MRI because I was convinced I would find uh, prostate, biopsy, uh, prostate cancer on his biopsy. So I did the systematic biopsy on him, which did not show any cancer. Uh, four weeks later, I did an MRI on him because having a PSA of 92 and a negative prostate biopsy didn't make any sense. So he was found to have actually an anterior Pyrex 5 lesion on the uh, prostate MRI. And this is his image here. You see um, basically the prostate uh, outlined in red. The yellow is the target. And this is an anterior lesion, basically. And when you think about the location of the systematic biopsy, right, they're all in the, in the peripheral zone in the back. This is where the rectum is here in the back. This is where the transrectal probe is. And we take samples from the peripheral zone in the back. But having an anterior lesion that we can't see on the ultrasound um, totally, of course, was missed by the systematic biopsy alone. So I uh, went and did a, a fusion biopsy on him. I only targeted actually um, the anterior lesion based on the MRI, and he was found to have at least a nine basically in this anterior lesion. And this is just an anecdotal case, uh, but I will never forget that actually this patient um, would not have needed two biopsies to diagnose this cancer. I've had an MRI done before, and just because he was biopsy naive, I didn't do the MRI initially, but this uh, really, based on the trials that came out in the last few years in this case, really made me change my um, clinical approach in this. So the other uh, important uh, thing is also the, a, a learning curve when we do the fusion biopsy, um, because uh, clearly as we go ahead, as we go along, uh, we learned and, and become more proficient in this techno technique. Uh, this was a study published a couple of years ago in Journal of Urology um, that looked at patients, um, at more than a thousand patients that uh, underwent fusion biopsies over a four year period. Uh, they all underwent a multi-parametric three-Tesla MRI. Uh, there were a total of four urologists involved, and one radiologist um, read the MRIs, and there were three GU pathologists involved. And the patients basically uh, were divided into seven groups over those four years um, uh, and uh, were compared. So the results of this show that the cancer detection rate really increased for Pyrex 3 lesions, um, which you can see here in green, the detection rate for Pyrex 3 lesions increased from 12% to 18% over those uh, four years, over these seven intervals or, uh, during the four years. For Pyrex 5 lesions and 4 lesions, it increased from 50 um, to uh, 76%. So a significant increase here uh, by urologists, uh, how they uh, improved really their biopsy technique over those four years. Um, and interestingly, this is basically, it shows the increase of Gleason 7 or greater cancer 
that was detected for pirates 4 or 5 lesions over the years, stratified by two urologists. So the urologist A in blue and the urologist B in red. And basically, B is a less experienced um, uh, biopsy uh, um, performer, and uh, the urologist number A is a little bit more per, uh, experienced. And you can see they start at different levels, and they both improved over time. But urologist B always basically stayed a little bit behind, even after those four years. But both of them improved. But when the um, when, when these two urologists were looked at basically based on biopsy numbers, sorry, based on biopsy numbers alone, they, had, they were actually on the same level. So when, they had this, when we looked at, not at the timing when this was done, but only at the biopsies, that the number of biopsies that they had performed during their career, actually their detection rate of clinically significant prostate cancer was pretty similar. But it improved over the, over the course with increasing numbers of prostate biopsies. So there is an increasing, uh, there is a learning curve and it takes some time to get used to this technology, but I think uh, the more cases that are being done, the more accurate the detection really of these, um, of these targeted lesions. Uh, so it is uh, you know, important to understand that the, the, ex the experience of the operator really influences the biopsy outcomes, but what, all, what is also important is that uh, we need to have uh, quality measures at each institution that uh, make sure that the imaging performance um, and the interpretation um, actually do have a certain um, quality standard. We need to have interdisciplinary quality improvement initiatives. So we have to talk with the radiologists. We have to discuss uh, um, biopsy results and give feedback uh, uh, to the radiologists to improve the reading and quality of MRIs in general. So I just want to uh, finish by going over the AUA consensus statements uh, from 2016. Clearly, they're already a few years old, and some of these statements are actually probably going, are going to be changed in the next few years. So uh, when it comes to patient selection, uh, the AOA consensus statement states that uh, the prostate MRI has a value for the detection of clinically significant prostate cancer in patients with a prior negative biopsy. So this is a little bit different than what we saw in these studies that came out just recently, where uh, really uh, patients um, that either had no biopsy or had a prior negative biopsy or even we had been diagnosed with prostate cancer before. In all these patients, the, there is a value to have an MRI when, the, when another biopsy is being uh, planned. Uh, which method of MRI-directed biopsies should be really used? Well, the consensus statement uh, agrees that software fusion and inward biopsy uh, systems have really a, a good uh, value, but we also have to keep in mind the cost of these systems, of course. Um, and the existing literature, some of it uh, I showed to you, supports that um, even the cognitive targeting is a sound approach for facilitating the detection of clinically significant prostate cancer when the other technologies are not available. So if we don't have the, so, the fusion software doing a cognitive fusion biopsy in the operating room or in satellite images where the, t the software technology is not available, is absolutely acceptable as it still increases the detection rate of clinically significant prostate cancer. Uh, how, many, now, how many cores need to be taken? And I didn't uh, really uh, focus on that too much during the talk, but uh, it is recommended to take at least two per lesion. What I do is if I have very large lesions, I take sometimes uh, four or five uh, cores per that lesion, just because I would like to really uh, cover the entire target. If I have very small lesions, I also sometimes tend to take maybe an additional core because if you have a very small lesion, the error margin is very high um, and the risk that the lesion is actually not in the exact same spot that you, um, you know, after the fusion process with the software is, is given. So I tend to also take maybe a three or four samples out of very small lesions, but on average, I would say I take two per lesion. Um, what is the need really for the concurrent systematic sampling? Well, as we went through this, this data, even with an optimized biopsy technique and its expertise, up to 23 or even, as we saw, even higher uh, percent of clinically significant prostate cancers are missed on the targeted biopsy, even when all the, the conditions are optimized. Um, what is important is that the quality of MRI, uh, the quality of MRI acquisition, interpretation, and targeting technique itself can impact the detection of clinically, prostate cancer, clinically significant prostate cancer. And if you know, the, the MRI image is of not, not a great quality, if the interpretation is not great, if the three-dimensional image of the prostate on the MRI 
or the three-dimensional image of the prostate on the ultrasound and the, the, the targeting by the urologist is not, not great, then clearly those are high risk for errors really in doing this type of biopsy. Um, uh, and some clinically significant prostate cancers are not even seen on uh, the MRI. And this is why the systematic biopsy really, and based on the MRI first and um, promise trial, really should still be performed. And hopefully in the future, the MRI technology advances that we can see actually lesions better and that the um, that missing of clinically significant prostate cancer becomes less likely. Um, when, when can we really defer the concurrent systematic biopsy? Well, we have to decide this on a case by case. Uh, as I showed you one example, this patient that I did a biopsy on, it was negative. The uh, subsequent uh, MRI showed a Pirates 5 lesion in the anterior prostate. Uh, in that case, I really only targeted that lesion because he had already a systematic biopsy before. I knew what I was going to target. It was a very suspicious lesion, a Pirates 5 lesion. So I was very confident I would target that. Um, but, um, but really, the, the consensus statement here says that uh, fusion biopsy alone should only be considered when the quality assurance has been performed uh, to support the outcomes of an MRI-targeted biopsy in the local practice. So when we know that all these steps are of a high quality that lead to the to, to high-quality fusion biopsy. Um, when is an immediate re-biopsy necessary after MRI? Well, a repeat biopsy for persistent clinical suspicion of uh, um, prostate cancer is justified in the setting of, of an MRI uh, that shows a Pirates 4 or 5 lesion after a previous biopsy was negative. Um, you can re defer a repeat biopsy if a follow-up MRI is really normal, it's a Pirates 1, or has a, a, a lesion that is very uh, um, slightly suspicious only for prostate cancer when there are no strong clinically clinical other factors that are suspicious for the presence of clinically significant prostate cancer. But for Pirates 3 lesions, for example, the data is insufficient to really support that a repeat biopsy would not be required if a patient had a negative biopsy and then underwent an MRI that shows a Pirates 3 lesion. It is not really clear uh, whether the patient should go undergo an immediate re-biopsy, but this depends on on other clinical factors and how high the suspicion really for um, the presence of prostate cancer is in these patients. Now, and how do we follow up after a negative um, MRI uh, fusion biopsy? Well, continued follow-up is certainly necessary uh, and we need to uh, consider a re-biopsy if the MRI, for example, has been reviewed, if it was tru truly a, a, a highly suspicious uh, uh, MRI, the biopsy turns out negative, I would rather be inclined to repeat the biopsy in the next few months. As, as the consensus statement says, for Pirates 5 lesions and on the negative fusion biopsy, earlier rebiopsy might need to be considered. But if we go back and we look at the MRI and we say, you know what, the lesion is maybe not as suspicious as we originally thought, then maybe we do not have to repeat necessarily the biopsy early on where we can follow uh, with a physical exam, uh, serial PSAs, and maybe repeat the MRI a little bit later. So in conclusion, the MRI-targeted prostate biopsy allows uh, for the diagnosis of um, more clinically significant prostate cancers and fewer indolent uh, or insignificant prostate cancers uh, compared to a standard biopsy. Uh, the diagnostic advantage of MRI guidance really has been uh, thought to be primarily in patients with prior negative biopsy, but as we saw, it also appears to be true in biopsy-naive patients, and I would urge to try to get an MRI in every patient before undergoing a biopsy keeping in mind the uh, economics also, of course, that are driven by this. Um, performing a simultaneous systematic biopsy in addition to the targeted biopsy clearly offers a benefit uh, in the diagnosis. Um, however, the systematic biopsy, though primarily diagnoses low-risk prostate cancer, but it adds and has an added value to the fusion biopsy also in the diagnosis of clinically significant prostate cancer. Um, so this is just an overview of what we have done here at Columbia. I started uh, this program in 2015, October 2015. I have done about 700 biopsies since then, 700 fusion biopsies. Overall, there are about five to uh, maybe now seven radiologists involved uh, who are uh, trained to read prostate MRIs. Uh, we have uh, two designated prostate MRI radiologists actually now available who are uh, responsible for the segmentation to create the three-dimensional image of the prostate that I need um, to perform the biopsy. Uh, in our department, we have two urologists uh, who do uh, these fusion biopsies. As I mentioned, we take two cores from each lesion and then add uh, 12 cores uh, for, the, for the systematic biopsy 
and I rarely um, only do the targeted biopsy in only specific um, cases. Um, I, I try to hold a, a regular meeting with our radiology colleagues to discuss and review uh, MRI results. I certainly discuss all the discrepant findings. If I have a very suspicious MRI, a negative biopsy, I certainly go back. Uh, we look at the MRI, review them together, and come up with a plan uh, how to manage the patient if a, if a repeat biopsy uh, in the near future is required or not. And uh, usually all the radiologists really receive feedback on the MRI reads after the biopsy results are back, which I think is, is really important, um, uh, really important feedback to improve our quality of our MRI reads and, and then downstream of our fusion biopsies. That's pretty much it. So happy to take questions if there are any. All right, thanks so much then. Um, Dr. El Samra asked about any thoughts you might have on biparametric MRI, given that some patients cannot get gadolinium. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we do this actually often. If a patient cannot get gadolinium, uh, there is uh, absolutely no need to uh, have the patient undergo a higher risk procedure for that. We can certainly do them also without gadolinium. It's still extremely diagnostic and we still do fusion biopsies based on that. Absolutely. You know, the, the only, uh, there's only a minimal part of the um, multiparametric MRI that then uh, would not be able to be obtained, but there absolutely is a benefit to do that for sure. Um, and then somebody was asking, I'm trying to understand this question. Um, somebody was doing non-sonographic biopsies. Uh, sort of cognitively off an MRI is, I, I guess the question is, can you try to cognitively perform an MRI fusion biopsy? Or, or what are your thoughts on that? I guess I'm just going to generalize the question. What are your thoughts on um, cognitive fusion MRIs uh, relative to the actual fused MRI? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think they're as accurate, to be honest. I, and uh, the person who does them needs to be quite comfortable with uh, at least not, not reading an MRI, but at least looking at MRI images and understanding the location of a prostate lesion. But certainly, if the, if the fusion software technology is not available, as I mentioned, the cognitive fusion is absolutely acceptable and has still a, a uh, significant benefit over their over just the systematic biopsy that is non-targeted. So, if somebody's comfortable uh, reading MRIs and and applying that onto the ultrasound image, it's absolutely reasonable to um, to do that. Um, is that the question? Or yeah, yeah, I think that was that was exactly it. So, um, all right, I think that's.